Welcome back to One Man's Life Mission. I have a special guest on today's show. He's a traveler. He's traveled all around the world and he's gone to some of the most dangerous places ever. He's been writing books for almost a decade now. Uh, and he's not only been in the dating scene, but he's, he's been hovering around, you know, in the dating and kind of pickup scene. I wouldn't call him a pickup dude, but uh, he's been in there for quite a long time and he's got a lot to offer. So I thought I'd uh, get Mark Solo on. Uh, welcome. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for coming on. An absolute pleasure, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, um, I thought I thought we discussed this before. I thought we'll we'll try something different because a lot of guys they'll they'll get on and they'll just talk about boring topics. I think a lot of people might be more interested in you, your life story. Uh, uh, if that's okay with you, we could maybe just go through your life story and you can uh, you can tell us about what what got you into, uh, I don't know, where would we start though? Where would we start? How far? I guess we go? we'd start at 18. Uh, that's probably cool. the best time to start. Cause a, a lot of, um, what I do, uh, started at 18. My dad gave me a copy of the game by Neil Strauss. At 18? So yeah. At 18 years old, when I was just about to go off to, uh, <laughs> plug, <laughs> yeah, the game is a legend. Um, he, he gave me the book just so I was about to start university. And it was also wow. the time I did my first big adventure. Um, so I went to Antarctica when I was 18. It was part of a scientific expedition. And that was probably the best trip of my life. Um, certainly the most influential. I mean, we had to rus- rescue a Russian research ship called the Vavilov there. We were battling the Drake Passage, which is the roughest sea in the world. You know, waves so big. That even though we were on one of the biggest icebreakers on the planet, we'd all get flung out of our bunks at night time because it was such a violent scene there. And that oh. trip kind of um, inspired me to really adventure, especially during my summer times in uh, university. My first summer in university, um, I went to Southeast Asia, like just the usual route, the banana pancake tri- trial, trail, they call it like Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. Okay, yeah. But what I found was when I was traveling, my travel experiences and my stories were not quite like uh, other people's. Uh, so for example, the first trip we did when we were 19, I ended up getting stuck in the country, lost my passport, um, got dreadlocks over there. I ended up living on a marijuana farm with a girl. A uh, local girl, and she kind of took care of me. Th- this place didn't even Where? have four walls in, in Cambodia. In Cambodia. Yeah, yeah. And this place oh. had only like three walls. Didn't even have four walls. This their 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 family home. It was on stilts for the floods. And my friend who I went with, let's just say he's still over there raising a kid. So that's what happened to him. <laughs> so he's, so he's, I, he got stuck there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he, and he ended up getting stuck there as well. We kind of split up because we had a big fight, I think, the first day we arrived in Cambodia. And we ended up splitting up, and he's still there. So I got stuck there. Wow. He's still there. Um, how, could, a kid. how could someone get stuck there? That's what I don't understand. How could you get stuck there for how well, long? For me, it was mean? my passport. I, I, I didn't, I, I, uh, I didn't issue my passport. I wrote about this in my first mm-hmm. book, What Happened Then. Um, my friend just, he lost his mind. <laughs> oh, so he lost his mind. Okay, that explains it. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, and there's a lot to this story. Actually, this is quite a story that spans four years. I went back to Cambodia four years later. There's a lot of drama involved, especially with the woman I was with. Uh, really, really crazy stuff. Um, but anyway, the next year after that, when I was 20, I wanted to kick it up a notch. So me and my buddy dan we went from cairo in egypt all the way down to cape town in south africa so the whole way through africa uh including uh you know we went into the congo eastern congo which was considered one of the most dangerous regions, yeah. regions in the in the world at the at the time and, and then we got into some serious trouble like we had to escape this uh sudan we uh, had some trouble with the police so we had to jump the border Wow. Uh, can you, can and you then, run fast? Are you are you a good runner? Uh, decent enough, not that fast, but uh, I, I I'm fast enough. But <laughs> yeah, but I, the, but then uh, we uh, we also bought like near a kilo of 
weed over seven borders. We got it in Chashiman, Ethiopia. <laughs> we even bought it on a plane. We were so stupid. Like my friend had, uh, he had cancer and, uh, and he survived it three times. So he thought he was touched by God. He thought it was invincible. And I kind of had that idea in my head too. I just, uh, we were just really stupid and reckless. Um, yeah, so that we, we very nearly ended up in prison because of that in, in uh, Tanzania. Uh, but I'm not going to spoil all the, uh, the best stuff. I mean, great, the, my, this is from my first book, so Naughty Nomad, it was called. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then the next year, we went from uh, Moscow all the way to Manila. We went Trans-Siberian Railway, Mongolia, China, oh. uh, Philippines. And then the next year after that, we traveled through every, every single country I hadn't been to in, in <clears throat> Southeast Asia, like um, East Timor and Brunei and Borneo and that kind of thing. Um, how do you, and yeah, the I, fr- I, how do you, I, I hear about people doing this all the time, but how do you uh, like uh, afford this? Or is it just, you're just like, I'm just going to take a little bit of cash and I'm fit and healthy. So if I run out of money, I can walk 20 kilometers. If anything goes wrong, is that yeah. kind of the, is that yeah, kind of I mean, I mean, it was, it was for you. It was for like the, we had three months off for university uh, in the summertime and I'd work during the year, you know? I have lots of different gigs working in bars. I was a resident DJ in Dublin. Um, I did web and graphic design. I worked in, uh, as croupier dealing cards. I had my finger in a lot of pots. Uh, I had like a small web business as well. I used to sell posters and stuff. And uh, so I just would s- scrounge together as much money as I could. And then I would just travel till it ran out. And yeah, I remember that first trip in Africa, we were proper backpacking. I mean, we had a tent and sometimes we'd, find like the back of a dodgy building in the middle of a city where it was quiet and just put, pitch the tent like homeless people <laughs> but um oh. yeah we would find we'd stretch our dollar in the early days um certainly uh, but we still go out drinking uh, have a good time and the whole pickup and girls thing i mean that kind of snowballed as, as i talked about in my first book as, as i go through it at the start i was kind of more interested in the travel and adventure and I slowly got pulled into this kind of addiction uh, with the whole getting flags as we used, we used to call it. Getting um, flags, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I was, if there was a Champions League for flagging, I, I was the champion at the age of 26, 27. I, just, I remember comparing it to guys online and I, I, had, I had been with near like a third of the world's nationalities in, by my late twenties, so I was I was pretty whorish. <laughs> what countries are What countries are on the list? What What one? What do you have? Like a, a blue chip couple of countries where they have like a small population. They're in like some little corner of the world that you want to go to. Uh, okay, so now I, back then I I did. The hardest ones are always the Arab ones, obviously. And I remember oh, okay. anywhere under a million people. I mean, I remember, I li- but I live, I remember at the time Malta, I live in Malta now, actually, funny enough. So it's not exotic at all to me. But at the time, I remember that was like 300,000 people. I was like, yeah. But um, now that the flagging thing kind of uh, burned me out when I was in my late 20s, I kind of stopped doing that. And I stopped writing about my personal experiences online, actually, at around 20. Uh, 28 29 i stopped writing about my experiences uh, because i found i was doing it for other people i kept oh, yeah. uh, i was like a performance monkey um ah, okay uh, yeah I, I yeah i was like i had to prove myself everywhere i went i had to get you know get x amount of notches and and i kept pushing the envelope out um and i just wasn't making me happy so i kind of stopped writing about that publicly and stopped being a performance monkey but um Anyway, the first, my first book came out and my, uh, the blog, NaughtyNomad.com, I'd, I've written over 100 city guides of that now. There was no one doing it at the time, really. It was about, you know, if you go to a city uh, where you go to pick up or score some weed, I was like the, the number <laughs> one resource for that. I think I still am the number one resource for that because Rush V Forum was big, but he yep. shut that down. He, he went um, all Christian and purged all the info. Yeah, were you friends uh, with Rush at one stage? Uh, friendly, uh, friendly with Roosh. Uh, we had a syner- synergistic relationship. I promoted a lot of his books. I was an affiliate of his. Um, we had a little bit of, because con- I set up my own forum, we had a little bit of conflict um, because of the, there was a little bit of co- like friendly competition. But overall, there was a lot of respect there between the two of us. Um, yeah, I mean, it's so we were, we were friendly, I would say. 
So, so you met him and hung hung out with him in? No, the, I never met him. I never met him. Oh no, really? No. We we just we oh. just email back and forth. Uh, no, it just never happened. Never never been in the same place, same time. Oh okay. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I had a friend that went and uh, uh, hung out with him in Poland. Uh, this was a couple of years ago now, just before all the um, all the wheels fell off. <laughs> yeah. and I met a few. I've met a few guys who've met him. Uh, um, yeah, as as now he's he's gone down the rabbit hole with the Christianity thing. I I don't really follow him anymore because uh, it's just it's I'm not his audience. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm not his audience for that. Uh, quite the opposite. Um, anyway, so the the book came out, and I got to like number one on Amazon for travel writing, and it was it was very well received. Back in two thousand and twelve. Um, yeah, 2012, yes. 2012, yes, 2012 yeah. yeah. And then um, I moved to New York and I wrote a book on New York. Uh, New York was my, like my hedonism at its peak. Yeah. Uh, New York was crazy for me. Uh, and also there I wrote my latest book, which was released this year, My Life as a Mexican Pirate. And that basically details, so after the first book, I had to like kick things up a notch and it, the, the stories were really extreme in the first book. So then for the next couple of years, and this sounds kind of crazy, but I, I ended up going up, going to war zones dressed like a Mexican pirate. So the book is my life as a Mexican pirate. Literally, my friends, we would rock up the Syria, Somali, coat of war uh, with like sombreros, fake mustaches, swords, giant inflatable bananas, eye patches, uh, sometimes like lightsabers. There was a pet chicken in there at one stage. Uh, just absolutely mad stuff in some of the most craziest dangerous places you can imagine we went to all across west africa from dakar to nigeria to the horn of africa went to syria lebanon jordan like mo- tons of europe like I, I couldn't count how many uh, countries in europe all over the caribbean and it was like mystery method if for your audience uh, p- the pick up stuff like times times a thousand it was turned up to 11 like if when you rock up to a club in liberia with like a light lightsaber and this yeah, and a yeah. sombrero and stuff girls go crazy it was madness was it, it was madness thing? huh was it a safety thing like like if you're dressed in that type of uniform like maybe the other guy the because you're going into dangerous areas are they less likely mm-hmm. to attack you because it's like oh, okay yeah, yeah exactly you know, like if you're pointing a gun him. you're like no i'm not gonna shoot that what the hell who's that yeah. idiot <laughs> it's like he he's he's adding value to society just let him walk around you know he's like yeah. uh, it's uh, I, I think yeah. i don't know if it was a safety thing i think it made us a target more than anything uh <laughs> okay but um, we did it for the lols, I guess. It, it was sort of something that kind of spiraled out of control. It, we never meant to do it for the girls and stuff. It was just sort of like a joke that kept getting more ridiculous as the years went on. You know, when I saw the cover of the new book, I actually thought that you lost your eye in Syria. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I actually thought that, <laughs> that you would be cool. lost the eye because there's the patch there. I actually thought that something had happened. <laughs> no, thank God. I'm, I'm getting older now. I lose my eyesight a little bit, but I still got both of them. Can uh, although we, I, I, I'm, I am getting more piratey though this year. I just got my skipper's license. And mm. you, you're the, you, you hear to hear first. This is the first place I'm ever going to say it. Uh, this is kind of a big plan for me for years. Uh, but on Thursday, I'm flying over to France to buy my first sailboat. Ooh. And yeah. um, so you're saving yeah. up money. You're going to get in the sailboat and then... Yeah, it's done. Do it's, I just got to sign the contract. It's on Thursday. It's like... Uh, Where are you taking done. this boat? What's going on? <laughs> well, Jesus. So... Um, the first thing on in October, I'm gonna leave it up there, and then I gotta do a five day sail down to Malta, where I live. Um, uh, South China want? Sea. Go to the South China Sea. It's Take a it bit. It's a. It, 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 it's a bit away. I. I. I, I if I just oh, get is. to Gozo, the next island, like I'm. I'm taking. It's baby steps. So I'm in the Mediterranean. So that's literally the opposite side of the world. Like if listen. You can- South China Sea, if you could land yeah. it on one of those islands, those fortified islands in the South China Sea, think about that. Think about that. World Great news. way to get arrested. <laughs> World news. World news. 
I don't either. I, I, I've, I've, uh, I've skirted, I've flirted with the media before and it hasn't been good. So I don't know if I want to be in the news. <laughs> uh, I got a lot of enemies out there. Um, but the, the plan is, so I'm doing a, I got a delivery skipper, the guy who actually taught the course for me. He's, he's going to sail down with me. It's going to be a five day straight sail down to Malta, which is pretty extreme for a first sail. Um, mm. But then I'm just going to learn the ropes here, maybe go to Sicily. Um, and then I would like to go across uh, through the Gibraltar Strait, down to Canaries, down to Cape Verde off the coast of West Africa, and hopefully next year or early the following year, sail across the Atlantic oh. uh, and then do all the Caribbean islands, the Lesser Antilles. How big uh, is that? It's twenty. It's very small, actually. It's a twenty-seven footer. It's an Alpen Vega. It's uh, foot. Oh my god! But, but that, but but these particular boats, they're the smallest size you can get across ocean. So back in the late sixties, early seventies, they built these things called pocket cruisers. They overbuilt the boats with these long, heavy keels, which makes yeah. them very sturdy um, for ocean crossing. And the model I got, I've wanted this particular model for for five years. And um, because it's these have been to Antarctica, even and for the size, it's crazy. Uh, and you know, they're liverboards. Um, but that, but listen, that that's mm. so far away from me. I have to just get used to doing the Mediterranean first. Yeah, uh, if I make it to the Caribbean, great. Otherwise, if I'm not confident with crossing the Atlantic, I'll buy a boat over in the Caribbean, maybe, and do the islands there. That's the kind of rough sketch. One step, uh, and then, time, yeah, yeah, just, and okay. also Libya's right there. Libya is right beside me. It's calling me. It's very reckless now to do that. Um, but I'm a bit reckless. Uh, I tried to get to Libya before, but it was 5,000 euros just to get through the airport with all the bureaucracy and bribes. Um, okay. I, had a con- I have some contacts in Libya. I have some Libyan friends. Um, but alternative, you could just rock up in a boat. The, the danger being that you get some smugglers who might take over the boat or you're going to get... Mm. This, Piracy is a big issue as well, but piracy, yes, it's very, mm. it's very tempting. Yeah, I ha- all I have is a spear gun, but uh, it's very tempting that ro- so close to me. Um, but anyway, that's just a wild notion. I don't, I don't, I don't see myself doing it, but you never know. Yeah. Um, yeah, but well, let's see. I mean, I've, as you've seen with this year, I, c- it's, I can't plan six months in advance. So, um, but for the minute, I'm gonna <laughs> on Thursday. I mean. Barring nothing catastro- uh, or disastrous happens, it's probably I'm going to have a title to my name and we'll take it from there. But uh, long term, like I wanted to travel every country in the world. That was kind of my goal because when I was 20, um, I had a HIV scare in Uganda, which yep. I'm sure some people have read about. Uh, and I, I wanted to go to every country. But I had I knew an Irish guy who, who did that by 36 and he had a bit of a midlife crisis. So now I'm just like, I've been, I've been, I was at my 100th country on my 30th birthday. Now I can slow down. I'm not in a rush to go to every country in the world. So, I mean, long term, I'd, if I was doing the Pacific, say in Costa Pacific, I think I'm thinking I could do that in 10, 15 years when I have kids. I'd like to do that with a family, even, you know, to say it across the Panama yeah. Canal, do the whole, get a bigger boat and maybe do that with a family, the, the Pacific and stuff like that. You know, I'm thinking long term. I'm going to, I'm trying to slow down. I'll, the sailboats are slow. I'm taking it easy. Mm. And they, I'm not in a rush anymore. And also I'm building, I'm building a lot here in Malta. Like I bought this apartment. I have three bars now uh, that we set up here. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, opened the third one there uh, very recently. I mean, we opened... And we have an import uh, business as well. We actually just did a collaboration with the brewery where we have our own beers. Um, oh. And this all happened in 18 months. Like we set up four businesses in 18 months. Well, like I, I, wow. I, said, I, I say we because I started the first bar and my, my, uh, my brother moved over and he kind of took up things to the next level because he was, he was like, you know, having the extra horsepower. Uh, and also my, da- my dad got involved. Well, I think my parents are going to move over soon. So, so we're building a little empire here in Malta. So uh-huh. life is good. So um, Have you yeah, settled down with one lady at the moment? At the minute? Yes, I have. I do have a girl here. Yes. She is from Colombia. Oh, oh, mm-hmm. oh, she's, she's traveled, traveled a long way, isn't it? 
Yeah, I met, I met her on a cruise here, actually. We're on a cruise in the, the Mediterranean with my family, and she was with her family. And um, I was actually with another girl on the cruise, another Colombian, funny enough, in Air Hostess. And, uh, and I was boasting to my brother. I was like, oh, yeah, I got the nicest girl on the boat, the best looking girl on the boat. And they told me that, uh, oh, no, there's a better looking one on the boat. There's a nicer uh, one. And I was like, where? And I saw her and I was mad about her. And, uh, but she never left her family because she wasn't in the bars. Or, so I think on the second last day, I just walked up to her whole family. And I was like, hi, how you doing? And I said, your daughter is the the best looking girl on the boat literally in front of like five or six of them when i was just asked at the dance and the rest is history oh nice yeah yeah but, uh, but i'm thinking more family sorry go on you gotta take that chance yeah if, if there's no balls no... man like i mean uh, how many guys do would do that nowadays everyone's swiping left and right uh mm. when i was when i was uh, ah. at the height of my uh pickup days like i didn't even have a smartphone like, you go up and talk to girls that's how, how it's done mm. i think still it, today I thought... still today mm. is the most effective way unless, oh, unless you're traveling, yeah. mm. guys sell themselves short so short by by playing the the online game yeah um obviously there's an except there's exceptions i mean if you're uh, in an Travel. environment where you're very exotic yeah uh, or you're like very high status on instagram or something like that the game is a bit different but um yeah but you can always do better with cold approach because 100 percent. yeah mm. i just I, you just can i mean it's mm. just go like how many you're there's no competition how many guys nowadays can have the balls to go up and talk to a beautiful mm. woman on you know very few yeah. Yeah, so, not many uh, actually. Cold ready to go. There's a lot of guys that talk about it, but yeah, they don't. Yeah, and and it sounds mm. like you looked for a, a nice, uh, smooth entry. You were waiting for her to come into the bar, but she didn't go into the bar, and then you ran out of time, and you're like, "Fuck it, I've got no other choice except to just do this outrageous thing." <laughs> There's no yeah. other way. There's no other <laughs> way. That's it seems funny when I yeah, it was a it was a ballsy move when I think about it, but um. It's usually yeah, the way, isn't it? It's like, I'm going to look yeah. for the, the most, uh, you know, indirect, covert way to make this approach. And then it's like, she's going, she's getting on the bus, she's getting on the train, she's leaving. Fuck yeah. it. We're going in. <laughs> exactly. I'm not very one. I'm not very good with indirect and stuff. I've always been pretty, pretty aggressive. My game was always yeah. very aggressive. Um, even in New York, you know, I would... That's what I wanted to do. Of, Good. New York. Yeah. New York. Yeah. I want to know about New York. Uh, I'm, I'm actually speaking to a few guys in New York right now, and they're telling me that they're traveling a little bit out, out of New York and they're having a bit of trouble. I, I know your story. I know that you, you played bar game and you, you had the status by being the, the barman. Mm -hmm. um, but maybe tell us a little bit about... Tell us a little bit about that. Well, New York, I mean, that is... It's the capital of the world for me. Uh, people from all over live there. It's the guys are very aggressive as well. I mean, there's a lot of competition. If you leave, if you're on a date with a good-looking girl, you go to the bathroom. There's a guy talking to her when you come back. It's super highly wow. competitive. Yeah, it's it's. I've never seen anything like it. Um, um, especially always up in Harlem. As uh, like a lot of like Dominican dudes, uh, Puerto Ricans, black dudes, they're very. Uh, direct and they have no problem going up and chatting so that's the kind of environment i was in um so after about three weeks i kind of learned uh the optimal style over there i would just be super aggressive i mean uh, the majority of hookups i had were in bathrooms at bars uh, it would be super <laughs> fast like super aggressive because i mean you could you could be kissing a girl and take her number down and you could have a good connection and everything and you'll never see her again. They, they're just flake. Or they, I mean, there's so much options over there. The girls are lazy. They're not going to get on a train and meet you. I mean, well, sometimes they will, obviously. But, uh, but it's super fast-paced. And yeah. you, it's, you just got to go fast and be super aggressive. And I learned that song. And I got very good at it. Uh, freakishly good, I would say. Uh, it became like... Um, it, after New York, uh, when I was in other environments it it was like having a superpower because uh, you could just kind of lock in you were like a sh you were like a predator not a predator but, <laughs> <laughs> but you, could, you could see you could see patterns and stuff and there was yeah. you know you do yeah. stuff like you know even if even if a guy is with our girls with their boyfriend or something like that 
she goes to the bathroom there's a good chance you go in there yeah i i know mm-hmm. i know what you mean yeah, um, yeah i guess I, with I online was... with online you got to be careful what you say especially these days i totally yeah. understand but yeah. um the mentality you know people misunderstand that you know it's it's good to be yeah. a little bit primal sometimes uh the yeah. west has lost that to some extent and it's not a bad thing yeah it's not really a bad thing it really isn't no i mean there's there's a lot i mean a lot of the guys uh are, are do that in a very negative way and yeah you know they can harass girls like where i was never i never got like a like a and like, because I I would I know subconsciously I can pick up cues. I never got like no or I I, I always yeah. could tell, um. So I knew when to be aggressive. I I could I could knew when it's going to work. And uh, yeah. and that thing about being the pirate as well and the whole because become a pirate for years of being mm-hmm. a pirate you become a pirate. And honestly, sometimes I would just pick up girls with grunts and like <laughs> rrr, rrr, and I poked them with my sword in the stomach. I'm like. Rrr. And then I pull her hair and it, it was, that was the kind of game I was running. I was like pulling <laughs> hair and poking and you know, that it was, that's, that was, <laughs> that was the vibe, you know, when you're, when you're drunk and you're dressed like a pirate, you, you start to become a pirate and uh, <laughs> so oh it's very God. primal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It just goes I straight for a hair that. pull. I think Hello. I've seen that at um, uh, St. St. Paddy's Day in Sydney many times. I think it, oh, it, that it, kind of. At, even at five o'clock in the afternoon on St. Paddy's Day in Sydney, it's, uh, that's pretty much what's happening in public. Yeah, I mean, Australia's <laughs> pretty, the dudes are pretty alpha there as well. So yeah, I'm sure you see that kind of, that kind of drunken, hunchy, uh, like, rah, rah, rah. Yeah. <laughs> the They're caveman like, game. Came? What the hell are you saying? I have no idea what you're saying, but okay. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the girls are like that over there as well. Some of the Aussie girls are pretty uh, caveman y as well. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, they are. They are. Um, not in the city these days. The, the place has changed. Um, Sydney CBD is pretty much Asia. Uh, it's pretty much Cambodia now. <laughs> Sounds like an upgrade. I don't, I don't know, not really, but, uh, but I, the Asian influence is probably cool. Because uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I am not a big fan of Aussie girls just because the accent. The accent mm. for me is like... Uh, when the girls, because a lot of them as well, they're very like, uh, they're a bit like the British chicks. They're just like really yeah. sloppy and drunk and yeah. like, like not very feminine. Uh, Pri- privileged and demanding. And, yeah. 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 It's not very stuff, feminine yeah. and classy. And mm. uh, that's not what the two words that come to mind when I describe <laughs> Aussie chicks. Yeah. Now listen, I'm sure there are plenty out, out, um, of wonderful women in Australia, but uh, mm. the ones you see, um, on the piss on holidays with their girls in Europe uh, are not very good representatives. No, or Bali. We have yeah, a lot in Bali. Yeah. 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 I was in Bali. Yeah. That's mm. pretty, uh, yeah. <laughs> Actually speaking about that, I'm thinking of doing a, a Mark solo, uh, little trip around, uh, New South Wales. I can't leave, you know, we can't leave New South Wales. We can't even fly overseas. We can't leave the state. I'm thinking wow. of getting a, yeah, it's really bad here. So I'm thinking of getting a van and putting a, I'm, I'm looking to buy a secondhand van and chuck a mattress in the back and go try some caveman day game in the bush. Um, well, I mean, I know a guy, an Israeli dude who actually had a blog who, who did that. He, he was van of victory and he actually did that in Europe. He had a van oh. with a mattress. He'd pull up to a nightclubs and then uh, <laughs> pull for the nightclubs in the van. Oh, that's, that's the ultimate pull location. 10 meters. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. He, but he, he, he deleted everything. He was like, he got so paranoid uh, because, cause it's, cause it's, it, it think of a feminist blogger in america who could take that scenario on that blog and make it sound like the creepiest goddamn blog on the planet uh, yeah mm. but the pickup guys were like all right cool because he was a jay who didn't show videos uh, of like in a private group and stuff he, he was like legit good he was good at pickup it was all it was all positive and um, but you know the spin on that could be so uh, it could be so awful mm. What actually, this is a good little topic for now. Now that the global economy is starting to collapse and with you traveling through to lots of different countries that are, you know, they they have a lower GDP per capita. Most of them uh, in those lower GDP per capita, you notice that 
uh, the poorer countries generally have a high, a, a larger, like they're mainly male dominated to some extent in those poorer countries, except for say Thailand, Thailand's very f- feminine to some extent, mm-hmm. but most of the poorer countries just generally are male dominated. Yeah. If the global economy is collapsing right now and the, there's a lack of goods going around and a lot of the jobs that women usually would do in the past that aren't really useful now moving forward, is it possible that uh, the, the drop in the global economy could also uh, have a drop in feminism and the power of that type of woman moving forward over the next couple of years? I mean, if you look at the, uh, the data, the more economic power that females have, the less kind of feminine they become. Generally, the more gender equal a country becomes and developed it becomes, the less those roles are necessary because w- women don't have incentive to mm-hmm. be super feminine because they don't have to rely on male resources. I mean, yeah. uh, you look in, in Southeast Asia or Africa like that, and even uh, Latin American girls are glammed up to the nines because they got to be, because they got to find a dude. And um, yeah. because the government is going to, the government is going to write them a check to get, um, you know, to get brunch on Sundays with bottomless mimosas. It's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, I, I think it's just, um, if you're looking from an evolutionary biology perspective, uh, it's, it's just a natural response to the behavior in the environment. Um, so where, where you're going to have a depletion in economic resources, you're going to have a bit more uh, polarity in the sexes because there will be a need, uh, more of a need um, for economic security and uh, for women to uh, look to... to I, I imagine even now, uh, you know, they call it, I've heard it uh, refer, uh, referred to as cuffing season. You know, when you come into the winter, girls go into cuffing season. Ah, uh, yeah. They, they look for a guy. Um, I can't remember where I heard that. But um, I think this kind of quarantine and lockdown is like created one cuffing decade maybe <laughs> where mm. women are definitely more uh, focused on uh, finding someone to watch Netflix and chill with because there's nothing else to do. I mean, all the yeah. all the clubs are down. It's hard to be promiscuous, right? Yeah, the the right statistics uh, that I'm reading at the moment about STDs is that they've all collapsed. So uh, the uh, uh, statistics amongst, like, just say, chlamydia, for uh, just as one example, mm-hmm. has dropped by I don't know, like, massive percentages like half or more <laughs> because mm-hmm. people aren't sleep. The, the nightclubs aren't doing that anymore. They're not spreading it around. Um, but, but what I was more thinking about is when you went, went back to the feminist blogger, if the feminist blogger, uh, would have power during, uh, you know, when through, you know, when, when the, the country's a first world country. And as you said before, they didn't really need the money, you know, they're, they're just wealthy <laughs> because the government was, you know, handing money over to a lot of women and the laws would protect them. Uh, is it possible that that blogger would have less power moving forward because uh, she wouldn't have time to be blogging anymore? She'd be focusing more on fixing her own life up. I don't think we're ever going to get rid of that strain um, of radical feminism. I mean, it's like 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 all the ideologies. There's um, they're they're sort of they're they're memes. Uh, always get um, always get passed on because there's the, remember there's been hundreds of books written and there's been whole you know academic studies that have been crafted um, to promote this kind of ideology. I don't think it's going away. I do think that people care less or it's not given a, uh, as much um, attention these days because people are concerned about other things. And um, but I mean, then again. Look at what's going on in the States with uh, the whole BLM process, critical race theory and the kind of leftist ideology is, is not, it's, it's a blaze right now, um, mm. quite literally. Uh, so I don't think it's going away, sadly. Okay. Uh, I think if I lived in America, I'd get the hell out. Um, mm. You know, that's a good thing about living in Malta. I mean, I feel like I'm just so... I don't even pay attention to any of that. It's like feminism or... 
BLM or Ameri- American politics and stuff. I've kind of just like, dude, I'm just going to get my goddamn sailboat. I'm going to go into the sea, kill some fish. Like, I'm, I don't give a shit. I'm, I'm building businesses here. I don't, this country is not like that at all. Malta is a bit more conservative. Uh, yeah. No one gives a crap about any of that uh, Western bull. It, it's, and they're very, they're, I think they're a bit more right wing over here as well in terms of like, they are right wing to, to, to a fault, I would say, because they're, they're, oh. they can be quite xenophobic, you know. Um, they, uh, but they care about family values and that, and that kind of thing. And I, I, all of that kind of leftist nonsense does not even touch the media here. It's not even a thing. Uh, so I don't have to deal with it. I don't want to think about it. Every time I'm on Twitter and I see all this bull going on in, in Portland or uh, <laughs> wherever, I'm just like, that's uh, just like, get away from me. That's well, there's, just... there's definitely a disconnect between what... Oh, in Australia, it's bad as well. You guys have a really bad... What? And what you're, you're... Not bad? No, I mean, I mean your, uh, your, your government is quite authoritarian, uh, it seems. Yeah, as uh, that's because of the way our economy is structured. Um, mm. As 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 when when your when your entire economy is uh, based on digging holes and going, oh, I found this, and then putting it on a boat and then sending it through the sea uh, to a country that has uh, geopolitical Actually, uh, yeah. to take over your own country. Uh, your time, you know, your time is numbered. And, and also the fact that um, our entire economy relies on the sea that's just north of us. And it's kind of in a transition phase from uh, the United States being the maritime power to going into China being the maritime power. Mm-hmm. So there's a... You're a, taking notes. <laughs> so so to when when our economy starts to collapse it, you notice it with many poor countries they need to mm. control the people more uh just to avoid any uh international problems you you can't have people living within the country going against it and that's when you start losing your freedom freedom is a first world uh powerful country yeah. privilege it is not uh it's not based on anything else that's that's really how the world works um do do is there hate speech laws in australia i believe so right yeah we don't we don't have freedom of speech in australia we don't it's not actually we don't have a constitution um and uh that allows the government to become authoritarian um to some extent later on um, and, yeah. and it really, like, if you think about it, if you're running the country, <laughs> you probably would become authoritarian just to prevent. And you mentioned the bogans. We have a lot of bogans here that would say stupid stuff and post stupid things. Um, and that's, that's partially why the government um, will become a little bit more authoritarian. Not that that's a what, good... Sorry, what's the bogans? I, I, I... Oh, we have, uh, we, call, we, we call them bogans. They're like uh, white trash American, uh-huh, uh-huh. American slang, you know, uh-huh. like you said, like the the Aussie girls that get smashed and talk a lot mm-hmm. of crap. We got a lot of those, and they mm-hmm. they as if the the country starts to decline economically, these people become a liability. Mm-hmm. So you have to control them, and unfortunately, that's our future, where the government will just start locking them up and putting them in their place. And that's not unfor- that's unfortunately how it is. But I also associate that with declining economy. And I also associate that with the best opportunity to move into pickup because uh, we're coming back, baby, I believe. We're coming back. We're getting the power back. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's why I thought... Maybe... Sorry, once I, once I have someone coming in there. Oh, is this... Uh, is this uh... oh, that's my, my brother, actually. Oh, All right, Shanos. Yeah, so so we're talking about New York, mm-hmm. and you're you're telling telling us a little bit about how it was really aggressive there, and then we we went from tangent to tangent to tangent. <laughs> yeah, yeah, goddamn. Uh, yeah, so New York. I wrote a book about it, Naughty Nomads Guide to New York City. It took me two years. I went to like hundreds of venues. I went to every single um, set, every single of every single neighborhood. I was blitz the place nightlife wise i really researched very well 
uh, all the different types of women you'll meet there as well. I broke it down to the, the nine types of girls you meet there. And um, I really ran the gambit from, uh, you know, rich, rich uh, Jewish chicks who were like the biggest skyscrapers in, in uh, New York to like, you know, section eight, uh, rough around the edges, kind of uh, N-word using... Oh. Uh, ratchet chicks. <laughs> oh wow! I, I ran the gambit. I ran the gambit. I, I and I had a lot of uh, um, experiences with 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 multiple women at the same time and stuff like that as well. And uh, yeah, really, it was really just crazy. And uh, that book is quite. It's really really informative for anyone who goes to New York or moving to New York. It's. I mean, I, I couldn't have made it more comprehensive. Nice, nice. Yeah. Uh, and um, but yeah, it was it was a great time, man. It was it was it was it was very. Uh, I got player burnout there, you know, uh, just just you know so much of it, and uh, you know, if I got player burnout, so that's always like ah, I, I, after after New York, I was kind of I was sort of a bit not done, but I was ready to move on to the next phase of my life, and that's like when I entered my early thirties. I came to Malta, started building businesses, um, got into a relationship, and now I'm thinking like about family and stuff like that, you know. So New York was kind of my uh, swan song. <laughs> Can you explain the the psychology behind uh, player burnout? I've heard it many times. Many guys have. Yeah. It's very common. Um, can you explain yeah. what, what it means and how it came about? Like what was going, you know, because a, a lot of people watching this are probably thinking, what, he got sick of like banging girls. How did that happen? Yeah. 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 It just to so much of it becomes, um, like if, if it's sort of like a pattern, I guess it's sort of like going out and getting a kebab every night. Uh, or this, <laughs> that's a weird expression, but, um, <laughs> It begins just to feel like the same thing again and again, uh, and the the body's change, but I mean uh, the same conversations this like when you're going on a date, it's the same you're running the same gambits you're you're making the same moves um you almost know exactly how it's gonna go down. It's just like you're just like waiting and and then after a while it's just there's not very much pleasure in it it's sort of like meh it's just it's not challenging it's not interesting even um it's yeah I, it's i am sure that 95 percent, if not more of men cannot possibly relate to this <laughs> problem <laughs> but uh it don't it doesn't last forever i mean it just it it it, it just you get to a point where you're like, you're just kind of like eh. It's more of a dopamine, dopamine uh, thing, you know. You, you just don't, you're not getting the the rush anymore. And mm. I, it's the same for everything in life. Same with drugs, right? You can build up a tolerance, um, where you're just like, yeah. ah, this gets a bit boring. Um, I mean, it happens. The the novelty wears off, uh, especially you know, it, it's very hard for novelty to wear off when it comes to that kind of thing with guys because there's so many different types of of people out there different colors different races different yeah. shades um, and there's different so many different experience but you you can you can pretty much i mean i i think of pretty much exhausted i'm sure there's not <laughs> i haven't exhausted everything but i i i exhausted novelty to the point where i was just uh i was kind of just meh i was ne- neutral toward that's what i would describe as player burnout maybe um Maybe, uh, maybe what I've described is better is better um, interpreted by my demeanor even now when I talk about it because you can see the you can see the kind of um, the lackluster uh, by which I talk about it. And, uh, that wasn't the most articulate description, but <laughs> yeah, kinda, <laughs> I hope I it was okay. Going, yeah, I, I remember um, seeing uh, you, you you put up a, a bit of a podcast when you were uh, you were about to reach 30 and yes. you said, look i'm i'm kind of that you you're burnt out you're sick of chasing women and now you, you you've realized that you've done that uh, and now it's um you've got to you you'd like to focus on also traveling around the world as well but now it's more focus on building a business and uh, get some money and 
And it, uh, another thing was uh, like like masculine develop in general. Like I started uh, going to the gym, doing martial arts. Um, oh, what's up? Martial arts? Jiu Jitsu, uh, Brazilian oh. Jiu Jitsu. Yeah, and I. I so, so this was part of the thing. I read The Way of Men by Jack Donovan. Um, and I inf- actually interviewed him for a podcast. And that was really around the time I got player burnout. And um, that way. got me... Mo- Sorry? The Way of Men or Men? The Way of Men. The Way of Men by Jack Donovan. And that was around the time I got player burnout. And that was really set me on a completely different path with my masculine development. Because in a way, I think all the time I was doing the pickup thing and trying to, you know rack up uh, experience and, and be the best guy or whatever. Um, it was like a sport, right? Uh, yeah. And the sport didn't give me much satisfaction. And when I read that book, it kind of set me, I realized that I was playing the sport because that's what I need to feel like a man. Cause I was like, Oh yeah, I'm a, such a man. Cause I'm, I've done this, 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 this. But meanwhile, I wasn't in good health. And uh, I had a bit of a beer belly, quite frankly, I had no muscle on me. I was, I wasn't feeling good. Uh, about wow. myself so much and then um, started uh, and i started going to the gym after i read that book and i got so much satisfaction i got way more after about three six months i changed my body like i'm not i'm not a bodybuilder i'm not super strong and stuff like that but i'm a huge improvement to where i was when i was like 26 i i scrawny little arms i mean and stuff like that when i was 27 and but now i actually have a bit of muscle i feel strong as well um and the dopamine only a little bit but but they were huge changes that were super positive for me and I felt a lot better in general. And then uh, after interviewing Jack Donovan on the podcast, he said, take up martial arts. That's the next thing you should do. And I joined a crab Maga gym in New York. And um, oh, that's that Israeli. That's that. Israeli. Yeah. The Israeli stuff. And it was madness. You know, they'd have like all these fake knives and fake guns and they do stuff like there was 30 people in the room. They just say, right, everybody slap each other on the head. So you had to like, <laughs> you got 360 people trying to fucking whack you in the head and you're yeah. trying to whack people so it was like super aware and after yeah. every single attack or something like that the instructor if you didn't look around he would slap you on the back of the head they were doing it like proper israeli style like they were like you're all too, you're all too soft Dish. and uh, <laughs> he would slap you if you were anytime you weren't paying attention he'd slap you because he's like you have to be always aware and um, but it was fun and stuff but uh they did a they started doing these introduction to jiu-jitsu classes Brazilian jiu-jitsu and i loved it so when i moved to malta um, i got there was actually happened to be a jiu-jitsu class that just started underneath where i was living like a garage underneath it and to this day the instructor who set up the gym like we him and me are he's one of my best friends here and um and yeah, so I, I, had a, I had periods where I was, didn't do it for like a couple of months on and off because when I was setting up the business, I was so busy, I had injuries yeah. and stuff like that. So it was, it's been a slow progress for me. I mean, I'm only a blue belt now. Um, but uh, I actually just won my first tournament there a month ago, um, oh, which is amazing. Um, but uh, it's been slow progress, but I'm try- now I'm, I'm a bit more consistent going every week and I love it. I love jiu-jitsu. It's fantastic. I, I recommend every guy, your, every guy should do it. Huh? I bet during your travels, you would have found yourself in a few street fights. That, that was another thing as well. Um, when I was in, I remember, that was part of the motivation to get strong and learned martial arts as well. Because like, I've been mugged a couple of times. I've never actually gotten into a physical, like something that's, I, ha- I have a, oh, I remember one toss I was in Haiti, I had four guys surround me. And uh, this is after the earthquake. And they basically robbed me. And the last, but the last guy, the, the leader, he was a big, tall dude. He wanted my shoes, my runners. And I was like, you're not getting my, you're not taking my shoes. I'm not going to cruise around barefoot. And uh, so I ended up wrestling him uh, for my shoes. Now I got the shoes back because luckily in the middle of the, the scuffle, uh, the, there was some guy came up on a motorbike and the guys got scared away. But I remember thinking after that, God, if I, if I had, knowledge in you know with those four guys i like you wouldn't start anything but maybe maybe you know you could do it just you'd have the confidence to just you know uh elbow one of them in the head and and just leg it or something like that because i actually it was cool um i did a martial arts camp about two years ago with thailand i went to in thailand with my two brothers like we flew over there for a couple of weeks and we did tiger Thai, we learned like my thai boxing oh, my thai, yeah. sword fighting 
uh, how jiu-jitsu had loads of stuff and that that's a really cool thing i feel like that should be a ritual that every guy should go through is try and do some sort of camp somewhere and uh, yeah, if you can kick if you can kick their legs or you can drop in a, a, a sucker punch you're like oh no oh no oh no oh. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you can have a boo and then run. <laughs> yeah, exactly. They don't expect it. Exactly. Suck, I mean, that's, go- that's one thing I like about jiu-jitsu as well, because like it's it's considered like the best martial art. Brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah. is considered yeah. if if you're a one-on-one fight, not very good if you're uh if there's more than one of them, but if it's one on one, the guy could be like you know, a championship kickboxer. As soon as you get close to him or he's on the ground, he's done. If you if you're even if you're a blue belt, um yeah. You're 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 pretty much gonna you're gonna win that fight against most people. And if you're a purple belt, I mean, I I don't know any other discipline that could handle a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Mm, yeah. yeah. See, but- notice the notice the enthusiasm I have talking about uh, going Jiu Jitsu and the gym versus when I was talking about player burnout. The, the, ah, the yeah. Yeah, come yeah. more alive. Because I guess it's always jiu-jitsu. new, huh? The Sorry. With Jiu Jitsu, and if you're wrestling someone and you end up on the ground. And they have yeah. a buddy standing up. Boom! You're gonna get kicked in the head. Oh yeah, absolutely. That's the thing. I wish they. You know what's funny? I, I, I made a tweet about this. Yeah, it's a huge stand problem. up. That's the problem. Hey, listen, if there's two dudes, bring a gun. Yeah. Yeah, or run. <laughs> two dudes run. need a gun. Yeah, I run. That's that's the way it is. Um, but I was made a joke on Twitter. Like it, maybe it would have been sta- like the pickup thing would have been more interesting if there was a belt system. You know, like yeah. imagine there was like a blue belt. Cause I feel like I was a black belt for sure. But, um, there you know, what I, ma- I made, we should I made it, we huh? should introduce it. We should introduce it. That's what I was yeah. thinking. It's like, I, yeah, I think that while well, one, I had a vote on it and like to, to be a black belt, you need to have like multiple three ways, triple digit, <laughs> not count. And a few celebrities and models. Like if you've done those, you got a few low, low list celebrities or models triple digits and a couple of three ways and uh, the good kind not the bad kind i think that's black belt territory um but you need to have all of them you know i think think the reason why it hasn't been established is because every man would want to try get a black belt and it would destroy society (laughs) it it would fail it would fail for the same reason that the whole the the whole pua thing went out of fashion with the the lingo and you know the the Mm even the term PUA and, and all the IOIs and stuff like that. Like as soon as guys get together and start codifying things like this oh. uh, with social dynamics, the, that's when the, the, the hordes come, the beta males and the feminists and start attacking it. So like anything that's centralized or organized uh, with pickup, uh, yeah. uh, it'll get attacked because it destroys the sexual marketplace. Yes, um, yeah. we, need, we need we need a good what ninety five percent of society that are blue pill guys that do all the work yeah. and marry up and you know we need the worker ants mm-hmm. and then we need like the little percentage of degenerates to take advantage of it. Yeah, <laughs> or society yeah, can't can all be the degenerates, you know. It's it's basic economics. It's the economics. Yeah. Of, mm. Um. Mm. Yeah, so um, you f- you won your first uh, fight. Uh, you, you yeah, it was a twelve, 12 man kumites. Twelve man kumite. Is that twelve rounds? No, it's twelve dudes. I had four fights, so it's like a knockout. It's like knockouts and stuff. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Yeah. yeah, so four fights, but oh, she's so tiring, man. Like I, any any competition, what happens is, you know it's all good and then you get as soon as you start to fight you get this huge after about two or three minutes you get the huge adrenaline dump especially your first competition oh. and that your energy just goes and uh it's, it's you need a lot of mental toughness it's it's uh and the headaches and you gotta make sure you drink a lot of water and uh, yeah yeah well and the great another great thing about joining the gym uh is you, like especially with for some reason jiu-jitsu attracts kind of smart people you know, whereas a lot of the striking stuff is kind of more oafish dudes. <laughs> no offense. I'm sure there's a lot of smart uh, strikers out there. But uh, a lot of the Jiu-Jitsu guys, we, we all hang out, go to the bars. And, you know, they become your friends and stuff. And you do international trips for competition. So, like, I went to Serbia, Milan, where you all go and you can compete. And it's sort of like a lad's trip and stuff like that. Um, so, that, that's that cool aspect of it as well. Because, uh, you know, we're, you, what you're doing with your podcast and i think it's amazing uh is you know you're looking to 
uh, reach out to guys and um, you know your viewers as well or dudes you're looking to improve their lives yeah, um, yeah. by interviewing people like me or or other guys in pickup and it's all basically self improvement. Yeah, but that's what it is. They can, learn. They can um, learn a lot just from your story. They can learn a lot from this. Uh, like, like even knowing, knowing that uh, there could be an end to it. You know, you could get player burnout and knowing that uh, there's advantages to doing jujitsu and all these things that they're all so valuable. I learned that early yeah, on though. I got in the, I got in the fitness early until I um, kind of destroyed my body. <laughs> Um, this your I know it's your book. Uh, it's called the Disabled Casanova. Like, what's your what did you what's your? Can you are you in a wheelchair? No, I'm not in a wheelchair. Um, but both my hips are steel. My entire pelvis has been replaced, pretty much. Oh God! And uh, what happened to you? Uh, just I don't know. Um, I wore it out. I, I did about eight seasons of rugby. Um, oh God, that'll do it. Yeah, eight seasons around. You're void of the ears, though. That's the one thing uh, jiu-jitsu players and, and rugby people have in common, the, the, the smashed ears. Oh, that's... um. I was a back. Cauliflower. I was a back. Ah. I wasn't in the scrum. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I was in the scrum, like, early days, and then uh, I realized that I could step and I had hands, so I ended up in the backs mm-hmm. um, in the later years. Um, and that's why the knee's gone. It just, mm-hmm. like... It was like, this is how the knee works. It went... The other way, so yeah, it's going to need to be replaced as well. So you, you've you're very limited mobility, is that it? Um, I I've two years ago had my last hip replacement, and I'm out of pain, so I'm actually doing really well at the moment. So oh, great, great. My right knee needs to be replaced, but it's it's there's enough muscle there. Um, yeah. So I I started out doing fitness early. I was I was I could bench a hundred k's by I don't know eighteen. You know, so I was, Whoa, okay. Jesus yeah, Christ. yeah, I was like lifting weights and, and doing all that early and surfing. So I lived on the beach too. So, mm-hmm. uh, so the cardio, um, and, and also it was, I had a, you should read this. <laughs> it's an awful, yeah. um, but yeah, had a, uh, uh, yeah, like street fights and all that awful stuff. So I, we're going from the opposites, you and I. Um. <laughs> yeah, go, well, uh, yeah, go, going into pickup. Oh, there's a lot of guys like that. I mean, a lot of guys get into pickup uh, in their 40s and 50s. I mean, if you read the red pill stuff, how many guys get into it from a messy divorce uh, yeah. or, or a bad breakup? I mean, that's, that's such a common path. And I, I just got in there early at 18. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you read uh, Venusian Arts Handbook by Mystery. No, no, I. That's I for me. That's read. like the Bible when it comes to pickup and um, the Venusian Arts Handbook. It's it's mystery is a guy that Neil Strauss learned from the author of the game. Yeah, and it's yeah. basically a condensed version of all the the ju- It's all the meat. Okay, it's a very small book, um, but it's it's basically all the pickup I've used. All the is basically mystery method. I'm a big proponent of mystery method. I don't think there's been much improvements on it. Uh, you know, there, there's been lots of different iterations and there has been lots of new gambits and techniques and a lot of good stuff out there. But for me, it all goes back to, to Mystery Method. He covered pretty much wow. everything in that book. But he talks about um, in life, you know, to be happy, there's, there's three uh, corners. And that's health, wealth and relationships. Now, there's some people who add a fourth, which is uh, spiritual. <coughs> I'm not the most spiritual guy, to be honest. Um, but um, health, wealth, and relationships. So you had been in health earlier, uh, and now you're coming into relationships. Guys um, tend to focus on one area or the other. Uh, so, but to really to be happy, you should be l- focusing on all of them. I was all about relationships oh. in my 20s, just relationships and girls. Neglected my wealth, neglected my health. Um, and so now coming to my 30s, I'm, you know, using this more holistic model um oh definitely the best way to yeah, go so yeah yeah definitely the best way to go mm, yeah the venetian arts interest Venu- venusian so like your martial arts is mars the god of war venus the god of love quite a quite a cool um quite a cool way of doing it and you know i was thinking about this i've been thinking about this for years because you know people say seduction science and go- a lot of them people like to use data and science and evolution yeah, biology is it one is, did it, didn't that mean, isn't that, isn't it Maslow's, Maslow's hierarchy of need? 
something like that. It's like it's an actual yeah. psychological term. Was it was that involved in uh, Mystery's book? Not really. He didn't. I I, I don't recall uh, referring to the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, it was just a more. It was definitely more simplistic. Uh, version of the uh, Maslow's I think would be an expanded version of that um because I think there's quite a few areas to that I think it breaks down but I think a lot of it can be just categorized into the health wealth relationships uh paradigm uh, and there is a spirit some people use a uh, spirituality as another uh component like I, ha- I haven't delved too much in the philosophy of that now but um mm. uh, but the oh what was I saying oh yes the Venusian arts you know I was thinking about this I always thought mm, a lot of the guys who teach pickup, they go into the science of it. You know, they talk about, um, uh, you know, biology and evolutionary yeah. biology uh, and seduction science and stuff like that. And then I was thinking, about why is it, why would it be considered an art? You know, pick up artist people. Say. Yeah. Yeah. And I always thought, I always, I always never, I never used to say I was a pickup artist. It's like I'm a fucking disaster artist because if it was a painting for me, it would look like a monkey did it. Because uh, there's so much little mess in the rejection. That's modern what? art. That's that's yeah. modern art that goes. That, it was ugly. That gets the most money at the moment, right? Yeah. The Jackson. Yeah, Pollock. exactly. Exactly. It was a Jackson Pollock. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but then I was thinking about it. Uh, what is art? An art, the best art, it requires creativity, and creativity is what separates the masters. Um. From the students yeah and yep. it's great it's creativity it's like any conversation there's there's uh you know in, in a way you need to be creative mm. to move things on to the next uh step you know there's it's a creative process because you're you're working in a fluid motion because you're not dealing with a with a brick wall you're dealing with water you're dealing with something that's changing the dynamics are always changing so okay. there is an artistic element to it Mm, and so you're kind of seeing one? that with the martial arts. You're kind of seeing that with the martial arts to some extent. Bingo. Exactly. It's, it's like jujitsu. It's, it's a play because they're going to do something. You're going to do something. Mm. The best uh, jujitsu artists are also creative because they need to be creative by reading the situation. Yeah. And so, yeah, so that, that's, I, 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 I know I see there's a huge uh, similarity, huh? Yeah, so if you if if you're you do one thing and you know that he's going to do that and then you got to do this, if you can yes. preempt three moves ahead, that's what, that's that's when the innovation comes in. That's that's why I talk about this with uh, with my channel is I I try to teach guys to innovate because you 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 nailed it. It's an art for a reason. They call it an art because you need to innovate and come up with your own individual way based on who you are, you know, and same as martial arts, you know, um, we're not all the same. Yeah, there's, there's a huge uh, component. So I, again, like, so I think like mystery kind of hit the nail on the head again with that. He was a, he was an innovator for sure. Mm. Yeah. Um, so that's, I, I recommend people go to start learning personally and uh, the game and the, the new scenario town book that for me, that's been great. And his concept of peacock and like, we took that up to 11 and that goddamn that stuff works and, and things like people don't do anymore and um, like anchoring you know like i remember one time in, in new york i had like i went to like a chinese store and i bought i think like 50 of these bracelets i think they had the irish colors on them and i used to use the bracelets to anchor you know if girls are like they'd put the bracelet on them i was like wow. girl, crazy for all that kind of stuff and we used to do a lot of that because they feel special and stuff like that but it, it, you'd you could do it like talk to someone and you could put a bracelet around them, especially with the mexican pirate stuff we used to have hats and stuff as huge anchor and you could walk away for the rest of the night and does this kind of you know that they have this kind of reminder and there's something kind of sweet and innocent about it that like these are powerful techniques um uh, that yeah. nobody uses nowadays and and uh, even some of the really dark arts the dark arts is the nlp stuff uh, the Ross Jeffrey stuff. No one, no one talks about that anymore because that's kind of creepy, I suppose. Because when you embed commands in speech, um, there's some really dark stuff you can learn. It's it's powerful, powerful stuff that uh, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the guys nowadays, they don't learn about that kind of thing. Mm. Is it really effective? You think? Well, from my personal experience, yeah, extremely. Uh, the in fact, in fact, the when I. When I was 18, 19, 20, I used to try the, the NLP. So my friend was a 
he studied with Richard Brandler, and I actually went to see Richard Brandler, who, who started NLP. And he, he used to, uh, we used to play off, we used to learn from each other and try stuff. It was so powerful, that stuff. I, I actually stopped using it because it felt like a sort of, not like hypnosis, but it felt, the stuff I was able to get girls to do in front of the friends was, it didn't feel right. It did not feel right. You know, getting them to oh. really embarrass themselves or, or do things like that. It's, it's sort of like a hypnosis. It is, it is sort of, the, that's why I call it the dark arts. I actually stopped using it when I was like uh, my 20s because it just didn't feel, it did not feel right. That kind of stuff. It felt wrong. Oh. Yeah, but that's powerful stuff. I mean, there is a dark side to pick up, but you can become, I, I call the NLP stuff the dark arts of, uh, of the pickup stuff. It wow. feels unethical, though. Uh, that, that's all I can say. It kind of feels unethical. You're the first person I've heard to actually, yeah, give it a um, such a say that say how effective it is that I've heard mm. anyway. Mm. Well, it takes a lot of practice to for like that, that, another another reason why I really don't like that stuff is because I you know mystery method and when the game came out there was a lot of it wasn't natural. A lot of the stuff back then was scripted. The pickup stuff was scripted. And NLP is scripted. Like, so you, you are weaving them into a story and in that story, you're going to, um, you know, uh, induce certain emotions and responses by embedding commands. So for example, um, you're telling a story and about a cat in a tree and uh, someone says, use a hose. And, in, and then I was like, no, 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 you're going to get that pussy wet if you use that hose. And uh, you shouldn't do that. Uh, but, but that's just a little. This is, but like, if you slow down your speech and put a downwards inflection in the the embedded phrase, the embedded command, uh, yeah, when, you good. could innocently be telling a story. You could make it very obvious, especially if a girl's drinking. You could make it very obvious, but just not obvious enough where they're they kind of know what you're doing, but they're <laughs> you're telling a story and you're getting away with it. And then all of a sudden, it actually it's eliciting a biological response where they're actually, they, they do find themselves getting uh, aroused and stuff like that. And they can't help it because you're just, you're feeding the embedded command. It's sort of like really cheeky jokes you're telling, um, but you just, just, you make it just not enough obvious where you can get away with it. Um, yeah. But instead again, the whole script is it's very effective. I remember sometimes that girls like, like licking my face in front of their friends and stuff when we're sitting there, like just stuff that you'd make, you'd almost embarrass them. It was, it was, it, it was stuff that uh, I didn't pursue because I didn't like the scripted elements of it. I don't like scripted game. I and said, that's no art. That, again, this is the whole art thing. It's yeah. not very artistic. Yeah. <laughs> and it, also, it works sometimes. And by the way, sometimes it doesn't work. It doesn't work in a loud club. You need like a quiet environment. You yeah. need to be very close to their ear. You need to be like whispering in there, you know, it has to be the setup. You can't be, so it's, it's not very. Um... And it's not exciting if, if you do, no. if you keep repeating the same thing over and over again, you get bored with it too. It's, that's the whole yeah. fun of uh, enjoying doing a, either a sport or an art. It's something yeah. new. You're painting a painting, it's a different art stroke or you're going you know, out. Yeah. Girls. You don't want to rely on your old techniques because it gets boring. It's you, boring. You know, that's yeah. probably why a lot of guys quit. They have the same sort of structure, you know? Mm -hmm. mm. Uh, so uh, we've, we've covered quite a lot of ground. This is it. See, that's why my life is something happened to your eye. Yeah. My life is a Mexican pirate. Uh, yeah. It's quite, it's decent enough, but it's like oh. 70,000 words. Have like, uh, we got like pirate maps in here. One second, I'll show you like this kind of thing. Maps of all the trips and stuff like that. Uh, pictures as well. Like uh, <laughs> there's some funny stuff in here. We used to like, we used to like give these. Um, when we were in Africa. We we uh, we we give our phone number on. We get a local SIM card. We give our phone number to girls on pieces of paper because you know if you because uh, the problem in Africa is a lot of the um, the girls you meet out at night are on the game. They're hookers, basically. So we got tired of dealing with them. So you'd have to do like day game um, and you'd find a girl and you'd give them your number. 
And if you're, if you're, you know, a dude in Sierra Leone and like who looks like me, there's not a lot of them. Uh, they pretty much always message you back, but they kept on messaging back. Even if we drew ridiculous things on the piece of paper, we, we started to test what we could get away with. So we started doing like cock and balls with your number and my name, to see if they text back. And they did. And they, I, I have like a couple of these in the book, but I'll just show you one of them. This is like one of the, uh, that's like, if, if you, I don't know if you can tell, that's like a uh, yes. yeah. elephant with a cock trunk. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's a um, that's some NLP right there. It's just an elephant. It's just an elephant. Is, I promise. Uh, well, we had we had fun with that. So it's a very fun book, full of funny stories, a lot of scary stories, a lot of near death stuff, uh, wars. There's there's a story of a suicide bomber there. I I got held for ransom. It's a crazy book, and that also got to number one on Amazon for um adventure travel and the reviews has been pretty much all five star reviews the reception has been incredible it's having the book best book i've written because obviously obviously i'm a bit more experienced as a writer well i wrote my first book when i was in my um early and mid-20s so you know it was a little bit juvenile the the tone and stuff like that but yeah. now uh i'm a bit more experienced and i'm really i'm really happy with that book and uh yeah we even had the book launch here on a pirate ship we actually did a launch party on an actual pirate ship. Oh, wow. So you, you've really yeah. put a lot of effort into this. Wow. Oh, yeah. Years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, man. Oh. Um, and I don't that, know what the ne- what's next. I don't know. That was the question. That was, Sailboat. <laughs> that was the question. What's, what's next? Sailboat. Um, Marriage? Um, uh, kids marriage um i definitely actually want to have kids and a family um in the next three four years i think that's a good time for me uh, like i'm 34 i'm turning 34 this month so i mean i'm at that stage of life you know 30 when i hit 35 between 35 40 i think that's a pretty decent age to start having a family uh, i don't want to leave it too late uh, i really have an amazing connection with my parents uh uh, they had me very young. Like, I think my dad was 23 when he had me. Uh, and that bond has been like, he's one of my best friends. And I'm sure he's going to, he, like he went traveling. My parents went traveling with me um, to Mongolia. They went to Gambia, Senegal with me. Actually, they get mentions in the book as well. They're with me for a bit of that. And uh, we're a very close-knit clan. Even my, um, my, I have 11, my dad has 11 brothers and sisters, 27 cousins. We meet up loads of times a year we do like a week away in the summer we do trips to europe together and um, we're ver- and that whole family unit i'm very blessed to have a great family and i want that for my kids and so family is very important to me um so i'm looking forward to that next chapter my life is going to be a bit, a bit different of course it, um, part of me is always going to miss the the pirating and the craziness uh i will always keep traveling i i even I went to uh, Belarus and Ukraine with the guys there uh, in January. I went with some friends to Nepal last year. So I always do my separate trips with the guys. Uh, anyways, like I'm always going to keep doing that, even with the family, because I think it's very important for guys to have guy time. Um, that, that's so, I don't think people, guys have this thing where, yo, know, yo, when you start having a family, you got to just give up everything and you have to just, stay at home and now you're now you're this guy Mm. but i don't i don't i don't i don't believe in that i think you live life without you know you can make some compromises but as for having adventures with the lads and stuff like that for me that's not something i'm willing to compromise on so i think i can do both i think i can have a balanced life where i get my bit of adventure um uh hang out with the lads build businesses family i think I'm going to try and do as much as possible and just, uh, yeah, man, I, I don't think you have to do one or the other. And I think that's a mistake a lot of guys made. They, they're fearful of uh, moving on with their lives because they don't want to give up what they have. But you don't necessarily have to give it up, you know. If you have a strong frame and you set down expectations and you stick to them, you can live a life without compromises. I think that's a good way to end. I was perfect. I was perfect. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on. And um, for you guys at home, make sure you check out 
uh, the new book. I might leave a link in the description. That might be easier. Um, Mexicanpirates.com or you can check out my website, naughtynomad.com. Perfect. And uh, if you guys at home, make sure you click the subscribe button. You know the usual. And uh, I'll see you in the next video. Um, An absolute pleasure. And listen, best of luck with, with the One Life's, one life's one man's Life Mission no uh, one, project. Yeah, right. <laughs>